incontinence can occur at any age. In children, we need to learn to control our bladder, so you'll see bedwetting in children. Can sometimes come back if they have emotional stresses and trauma, so we can see this in children. And then later on in adult life, it's uh, more prevalent in the later. Ever had accidental leaks down there? What is that these accidents are perhaps becoming a bit more frequent? What is that you often cannot hold it too long and wet yourself a little before you get to the toilet? If not, are you worried that it's happening too often to someone close to you? Are you perhaps too embarrassed to talk about anyone about it? Well, stay tuned because today we discuss urinary incontinence and we may actually have a solution for you. We'll be joined in studio by a specialist urologist, chairperson of the Pelvic and Women's Health Physiotherapy from the South African Society of Physiotherapy. And we also have a sports scientist that focuses on pre- and postnatal training. Now, they will share their expert knowledge on the subject, including the impact urinary incontinence has on their patients. So be part of the show by asking the panel some questions or simply just sharing your views with us. The number to call is Johannesburg 714-6918 or 6919. You can also tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. Sit back, relax, and learn from this bumper show coming to you just after a short break. I'm Dr. Salomon Dahoum, and this is our talk. They need to step up and take responsibility. He believes that these banks were actually enablers of state capture. I um, met senior directors of HSBC and Standard Chartered. I found a great reluctance from both of them. Reverend Frank Chikane was uh, very actively involved in calling out state capture. The Guptas would tell you, if you don't do what we want by Wednesday, you won't be a director general. The murder case has uh, implicated some senior public servants. Tell us more. Indeed, uh, this case has gained more traction, as we see, after an auditor has testified on the financial flows between Siemens and Bagili. Department of uh, Community Safety, Security and Liaison and the Department of Health had promised that it will strengthen security in all hospitals in the province. That has not yielded any positive results. All right, so it's a great pleasure now to welcome our guests who are going to take us through the subject of urinary incontinence. And first up, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Salim Chunara, who is a specialist urologist based at Mill Park Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Chunara. Thank you, Salim. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. And of course, we also have Dr. Corlia Brandt, who is chairperson of the Pelvic and Women's Health Physiotherapy from the South African um, Society of Physiotherapy. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank uh, you. Nice Dr. to be here. All right. So, so perhaps let's start, let's start with you and, and, and just explain these concepts, uh, you know, of incontinence. But before we do that, I think it would be proper so that people know, have an idea of what, where we are in the human body. The anatomy. Let, let's talk about, you know, the bladder system sure. and compare males with females and so on, so that at least, you know, it makes sense when we continue our discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's maybe start on the top with the kidney because yeah. the kidneys produce the urine. Right. And from the kidney, there's a tube that connects the kidney to the bladder called the ureter. Right. Up to the bladder, that's pretty much the same between males and females. Right. Uh, from the bladder, the urine will come out to the exterior via what we call the urethra. Right. In the male, obviously, it'll come via the penis. That's why the urethra is longer. Right. And in the female, obviously, the urethra is much smaller. Right. Uh, what's common, again, at that level is that uh, something called the pelvic floor, right. uh, where the urethra, or the tube that connects from the bladder to the outside, yeah. passes through this very complex musculature called mm. the pelvic floor muscle. Right. which in essence also aids in terms of control. Mm -hmm. So often you find people sort of holding on that muscle that you can control. Yeah. That's pretty much the, the muscle that you are exercising or that you are exerting control over to prevent the urine from coming out and messing yourself right. until you get to the bathroom in time. Yeah. So that's generally the mechanism. So, so it's voluntary in the sense yeah. that you can control it. Right. And hence when there's a deficiency with that mechanism, yeah. the topic we're talking about today, incontinence, becomes an issue then. All right. So let's talk about the, the physiology, in fact the control of this. We learned that there's a sphincter that actually closes up to keep the urine in the bladder. That's right. And, and, and how does the message get through to the muscle to say, look, now it's time to, you know, uh, empty the bladder? 
Absolutely. So it's, it's very interesting. I mean, the bladder, uh, the circuitry of the bladder is, is quite phenomenal. Uh, it's got an amazing uh, network of nerves that supply the bladder as well as that sphincter muscle that allows you to control. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if one can think of it in this way, when, when you, when you, as your bladder is filling up, there's, there's special receptors in the bladder wall that will now signal to the brain that the bladder is kind of full, you need to get to the toilet. Right. But, you know, there's an initial warning where you find you're okay, you can still have time, and then there's the, the second warning, the later one, where now you're really under pressure. Yeah. But the point is that once the bladder fills up, the, re the receptors are activated, telling the brain, okay, you need to go to the toilet. Yeah. In this time, you still have full control of that, that sphincter because it's closed. Yeah. Bladder's filling up above, sphincter's closed at the bottom. Yeah. And then when you get to the toilet, you voluntarily relax the sphincter and the muscles contract of the bladder, to empty the bladder. And, and it forces the urine out. That's right. the physiology behind it. You know? Okay, so, so what is incontinence then? Okay, so incontinence would be then where, 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 when I mentioned to you about the voluntary control of that sphincter, yeah. so we can think of incontinence as the involuntary loss of urine. Right. You don't want the urine to come out at this point in time, yeah. but it's never there's coming out. Right. And, and that is where we're going to try and define it now. Yeah. So I think the two big areas that uh, we generally face as urologists uh, are what we call stress incontinence yeah. versus something called urgency or urge incontinence. Yeah. So if we think of stress incontinence, it would be, and a lot of people may identify with this phenomenon, when you cough, laugh or sneeze, something bend over, pick up something heavy. Uh, some people even say when they drive, you know, they get out of the car, get into the car. Mm. That kind of movement, uh, sort of rise in abdominal pressure. Yeah. What that does is, is because there's weakness of the supports of the urethra, yeah. you find that they leak urine. So yeah. it's not voluntary because they don't want it to happen, yeah. but it happens because of some activity they were engaged in. Yeah. That's the big area called stress incontinence. Okay, before, you know? before, before that, um, um, we need to just talk about, you know, obviously how common this, this, this is. Uh, and let, let's come to you, Dr. Bryant. I mean, from a physiotherapy yeah. perspective, I mean, you often, often deal with quite a lot of these. Uh, just give us a sense of what you guys do, um, you know, or at least who do you come across with these kind of problems? Um, well, you know, it's women actually across the lifespan that yeah. have problems like these. It can yeah. be from after they gave birth, even before it sometimes, yeah. up to, you know, especially in the mid years when they start having changes, um, menopausal changes as well. And then, of course, as they age as well, it also becomes a bit more common. Yeah. So, but it's, you know, about one in four, every four women um, can have some type of incontinence, as he also said, you know, these different types. Yeah. Um, so it depends on, on you know, usually it, it's a process that can actually progress. Um, they can start leaking a little bit, and usually they start a little bit with stress incontinence. Yeah. I think it's the most common one that we see as well. Right. Um, but, but largely you're saying you're seeing it in women. Yes, most, right. mostly women. Okay, what about males? I mean, do, do they get affected? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, by far, uh, incontinence across the ages is more mm. common amongst females, yeah. and also more common with aging. Yeah. in the female population as well. Right. But yes, we are seeing, seeing it in males, particularly a type of overflow type of incontinence, which can be a feature of an enlarged prostate, urinary tension, and then they, your bladder just can't hold anymore, so you just leak urine, type yeah. of overflow incontinence. Yeah. And then obviously the other one, which is a big area that we now we've seen, is in patients that have a treatment for prostate cancer yes. in the male population, yeah. where as a result of surgery or even something with radiation, they have some degree of either stress or even urgency or even co total incontinence yeah. because of damage of the sphincter. Yeah. So we've seen it in that group as well. Yeah. But I think by and large, I do agree that it's, it's, it's more common amongst females. What, what about age? I mean, you know, do you see it in younger women, middle-aged, older women, just to experience? I think it's most common in the middle-aged women. Um, yeah. But you do get, especially in, in younger women, I think sometimes, you know, unfortunately, um, Patients are very shy to talk about these things. So I think many cases are actually we don't know about sometimes. So there are younger women. Um, if it's in a younger woman, it's many times related to um, labor and pregnancy sometimes mm -hmm. and damage they got to the muscles, you know, during the, the, the labor. Right. But most commonly, you know, pa patients um, middle years, 40 to 60 years, I would say. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so just to, to clarify issues a bit, I mean, uh, uh, I think in the earlier clip that we played, we show a picture of a baby mm -hmm. and we spoke about enuresis or bad wetting, you mm -hmm. know, in children, just to differentiate it from what we're talking about. Just take us through enuresis. Okay, that's, well, that's, you, you know, when you leak urine during the night. So, yeah. um, 
And if you get it in, you know, in children as well, um, you know, the approach we take with children is quite different than we take in adults. Yeah. Uh, due to different factors that's affecting them, many times a lot of psychological issues. So, um, you know, if you talk about treatment for adults, it, you can't always apply directly to children as well. Yeah. So okay. I think that's important to understand, you yeah. know, as we talk about yeah. these things. So, so essentially, I mean, all young children, yeah. babies will have incontinence because, you know, yeah. perhaps you can take us through yeah. that. So, yeah. yeah, I just want to make a point about, I, I think in your research per se, um, it's very, very specialized, mm. probably slightly separate topic, I would say, Correct. to the bigger topic of urinary incontinence. Yeah. Uh, because it's a very specialized area, the assessment, the investigation, so the management, very different, right. uh, obviously more common amongst children, as you said. Yeah. Uh, so obviously in babies, just to, uh, so the people understand what we're talking about. I mean, you know, a child is what, just born or a few days old, is not going to yeah. be able to tell you I need to go to the toilet. Correct. That's why we have nappies and diapers, whatever you want to call right. it. Right. Uh, there's a reason for it is because the mechanisms that are necessary for voluntary bladder control are still developing. Correct. Hence... You know, you find that some kids will match the bed up to about four, four years, five. And some people go up to 11, 12. I haven't seen a child up to 14 years yeah. that had issues with uh, enuresis. Yeah. So there can be those issues as well. You know, it's just okay. a bit of a delayed development of bladder control. Right. Again, it lends to the point we made earlier about just how sophisticated this whole circuitry of the bladder is. Right. You know, right. from being knowing I must go to the toilet, yeah. socially acceptable that you can hold on, get to a, a reasonable place where you can urinate. Yeah. All that, these are all social norms that one complies with. Right. You know? Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted us to put it aside. Yeah, put it aside. Yeah, to, I, I ensure, to ensure that Thank you. we're clear that this is not what we're talking Good about. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Back to the different types of incontinence. We mentioned stress incontinence. Yes. Any other type? Yeah, so that's, just, that's the big one. The urgency that Kolya uh, uh, sort of alluded to as well. So, urge or urge incontinence. What does that mean? Urgency meaning we have in a chat now, we just sit in, all of a sudden you feel the need to go to the toilet now. And yeah. you've got to rush to the toilet. Is that urgency? Right. And if you don't make it to the bathroom in time, then you mess yourself urgent continence. Mm -hmm. um, that is more a feature of uh, where there's some involvement of the nerve supply to the bladder, mm -hmm. some irritability to the bladder. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can be a simple thing like what we commonly would see related to a bladder infection. Yeah. Uh, you just get in a UTI, and as a result of that, your bladder is very, very irritable. Yeah. And you're using the toilet almost every half an hour, hour. Yeah. There's this constant rush to go to the toilet. You, right. know, and you may okay. mess yourself, you don't get the well, time. I'll tell you what, we're getting into the realm of causes and risk factors. Yes. Perhaps it's a good time to pause for now. Okay. And we'll go for a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion on incontinence. Please stay with us. I literally feel like a kid in a candy store. From celebrities, politicians, we get to mingle with the who's who of Johannesburg. Part of the doozy to sunny experience brings you here to the highest park in Africa and you get to see these rolling hills that are behind me. As trends travel, we travel far and wide to find you hidden gems. This is where we take a look inside the world of media, analyzing the trends, the issues, and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. One of the things that we are seeing across the globe, people are consuming news and living their lives with their mobile devices. The evolution of journalism is to use the same skills, the same ethics, mm -hmm. the same values, but to cater to different audiences because it's not the same yeah. people. There is a lot of debate in this industry today whether the future is about digital pet content. Will there be a market for users to pay for digital content? And we see that in Africa it's a challenge. People will go, pay for a newspaper, take it away. Why won't they pay it on, for it online? In the initial stages of, of, of shifting from print um, um, to online, we created the impression that what people were paying for was the paper. And so people are very reluctant to pay for the journalism, and good journalism is very expensive. Watch Media Monitor, Sundays at 9am. On Economics Unbound, we unpack everything from corruption. On the day he resigned, he was not aware of any fraud. Of course, they called it accounting irregularities. We've always called it fraud. To the effect global activities have on different economies around the world. 
This drone attack seems to be the single worst sudden disruption ever in the world oil market. But what does all of this mean for South Africa and the rest of the world? The last thing we need is a spike in oil prices and a disruption in oil supply. We will have a repeat of the recession of the 70s, which is really very dire for the global economy. Join Tandeka and Nana on Economics Unbound, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Welcome back. We're talking learning continents with our guests. Um, we have close to me Dr. Corlea Brandt uh, from the South African Society of Physiotherapy, who's, by the way, also senior lecturer in the physiotherapy department at West University. Of course, you had uh, Dr. Chunara, a specialist urologist based at uh, Mill Park Hospital. We're now joined by another special guest, Kim Tasman Williams, who's a sports scientist from an organization called Yummy Babies. Thank you. Welcome to Health Talk, Thank Kim Thank you Tasman. so much. All right, we're going to come back to you just now because I want to know a, a bit about this yummy mummies uh, a bit. But let's come back to you. We were talking, we were describing all those, you know, different types of incontinence. Mm. We spoke about stress incontinence, urgency incontinence. Any other types perhaps? Yes, uh, we can also group them into something called functional incontinence. Right. Functional would mean that you're just unable to get to the bathroom in time, for example. People that are arthritic, yeah. people that have difficulty walking for whatever reason it may be. People that are inebriated, very, yeah. because have a bit, lot to drink the night before, just very drowsy, yeah. lost bladder control. So it's more functional. You yeah. know, you just can't make it to the bathroom in time. Yeah. Predominantly, I think, what we see in our practice. Yeah. Then the other big area is something called overflow incontinence. Yeah. I mentioned earlier about patients that have enlarged prostate. Yeah. They go into urinary retention, for example. The blood just continues to fill, and they just start leaking urine because the blood just can't hold enough now. Yeah. It's just leaking out. Yeah. Uh, the, in that group also we see patients that have underlying neurological diseases, yeah. uh, spinal diseases uh, such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease also will fall under that big group of overflow. Yeah. And then what we something we, you, patients often know about or we often hear about something called a neurogenic bladder yeah. where the, you know, the, the circuitry of the, of the bladder, the nerve supply is directly affected. Yeah. Um, and that can either be from the brain that it's affected or it can be at the spinal level. Yeah. For example, like patients with spinal cord injuries, yeah. paraplegics, for example, yeah. the nerve supply to the bladder is affected. The communication with the brain is affected because right. of the spinal injury. And as okay. a result of that, they have this type of overflow incontinence. Yeah. And often they require some way of emptying their bladder, mm. either via catheterization or via an indwelling catheter, you know, some means of artificially emptying that bladder. Yeah. You know? In mm. the case of the prostate, if, the, if that's the cause of the situation, then you deal with the large prostate. Yeah. You know, you sort of do a resection, whatever you need to do to allow them to then urinate for themselves, yeah. overcoming the obstruction. All right. So the, I think those are the big areas that one can consider. Okay, all right, okay. So before we start talking about causes and risk factors, let's welcome Kim Tamsin. Kim Tamsin, please tell us about yummy mummies. Okay, so basically Yummy Mummies is a pre and postnatal service that we offer to pregnant moms and yeah. moms that have just had babies. Yeah. Uh, so basically what we try to promote is obviously staying healthy throughout your pregnancy and then also assisting in exercises that will help them with easier delivery and faster recovery after birth. Yeah. Um, but we also experience that a lot of moms obviously with pregnancy and childbirth suffer from some sort of stress incontinence. Yeah. So what we try to promote is to teach our moms how to activate the necessary uh, pelvic floor muscles and yeah. perineal floor, yeah. um, strengthen those muscles right. so that they can then reduce the symptoms okay. of We're going to learn a bit more about how you actually do that. Yes. But for now, let's take Winston on the line from Bumalanga. Winston, welcome. Winston, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Winston. Your question or comment, please, welcome. Yes, I'm just want to find out if my father is being unable to urine since in 2014. Then at the public hospital in Leipzig, they put a pipe in the back yeah. where the urine goes on in. Yeah. But he, during the night, he's suffering because the pipe comes out. He's having a trouble because the, the sheet is getting wet. So which kind, what kind of medication can you get for him? All right. The line isn't quite clear. Did, 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 did you get that? Yeah. Uh, what I understood was that uh, it's for his dad. Yeah. He had difficulty urinating. They put in a catheter for him. Okay. It's now connected to some sort of a bag that's draining the urine. All in right. Okay. I think I got the gist of that. Yeah. And he was asking what medical therapy or what 
treatment, uh, treatment can we can offer. Help, yeah. This is very much the point we made just now before we broke uh, for, yeah. uh, regarding the prostate. Right. I take it it's obviously an elderly male. Yeah. Uh, most likely the prostate is the source of the problem here. Yeah. In large prostate, have difficulty urinating. They put a catheter to unblock the, Correct. or allow the blood to not drain. Yeah. But that's not the temporary image. That's just the acute situation. Correct. You manage that, uh, you know, that retention episode. Yeah. But now one which needs is, to go Which further. is really something a little bit different because here it's inability to pass urine yes. because something is blocking. That's it. You know? That's it. Um, but they, they, they have a temporary measure there. Correct. Because okay. the catheter goes right in, bypasses the prostate into yeah. the bladder and now right. draining the bladder. Okay. That's not the final treatment though. Right. Um, there is medical therapy for that. Yeah. You know, uh, something called alpha blockers or commonly termed Flomax. Most people know about Flomax. Yeah. Uh, something we use to help assist yeah. One with an enlarged prostate to probably urinate for themselves. Yeah. Uh, but in that spectrum of management, yeah. if medical therapy is failing, then they often require for us to put a camera into the penis, yeah. look inside where the prostate is causing the enlargement, and resect the area that's obviously occlusive or obstructing the outflow of the urinary tract, what we call a TURP, right. or a, a transurethral resection of the prostate. Most probably will, but will be what he will require. I don't know all the details, but just sort of an overview of w what he will require. Okay. Okay. Dr. Brandt, we've heard from Kim Tamsin uh, describing the issue around pregnancy, you know, being obviously one of the causes of the incontinence. Um, but let's talk about other risk factors and causes in your experience. Um, well, you know, I think it's a lot has to do with lifestyle factors as well. Yeah. Um, you know, if we can make it a bit more general. Um, you know, it, people have to look at what they eat, what they drink specifically, mm -hmm. and also physical activity is quite an important issue. Right. Um, you know, they must also keep in mind, even medication that they are taking, you know, some of them are side effects, you know, um, we can actually cause them to urinate more than usual. So um, that's, you know, non-medical issues that needs to be taken into account as well. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. So in your practice, I mean, you, you obviously see quite a, quite a lot of these uh, people yeah. with, with this kind of problem. And um, let's just try and understand the impact that this problem can have in people's lives. Yeah, you know, I think that is the most important thing. Um, you know, these patients, it's not that I always say when you, like a typical patient usually complains of pain or, you know, something that's very wrong with them. For them, it's quite a, a quality of life issue. Mm -hmm. um, and our whole treatments usually aim to improve that. Um, to give you an example, you know, you, are, you get patients and they are very shy to talk about it, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, as you build a relationship with them, it many times comes out. For example, they can't go out, take a tour on a bus somewhere overseas because they can't sit in the bus long enough mm. because they don't know when the bus is going to stop, for example, at restrooms for them. Mm. Or they sit there and then they are actually afraid that they might start smelling mm. um, because many times they have to wear pads. You know, in severe cases, they actually even have to wear nappies. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so it really limits yeah. them um, regarding the you know, social activities, and they just stay at home, you know, in the in, in the yeah. end, if it's really severe. Yeah. Um, so the embarrassment, uh, it's quite a big issue, actually. Yeah. That's, you know, I'm sure you see that a lot, I mean, um, where people are just basically too embarrassed to even consult a doctor for this kind of problem. Do you often get, you know, partners, wives, husbands coming to tell you about, you know, these yeah. conditions? Absolutely, yeah, definitely. It, because it's a very sensitive area, it's a very private sort of area, yeah. and uh, you know, people don't really want to always talk about it. Mm. But uh, what we always encourage to educate our patients is that there's treatment available for this. You yeah. know? The key, I think, and, and, and maybe what, from your question, what we can take out of that question is that they need to have a proper uh, examination, a history, a proper assessment. That's the critical thing. Right. You know, I always, my, my, my feeling is always, and my belief is always this, that if you make the correct diagnosis, then your expectation and your, your likelihood of success is actually very high, yeah. the correct diagnosis. Yeah. That requires a good history. That requires a physical as well as an internal examination yeah. to, for one to identify what are we exactly dealing with. Yeah. You know? yeah. And often people don't shy away from that. You know, they don't really want to expose themselves to that. And yeah. Feel, yeah. You know, it's okay, I'll just, I'll just live with the nappy. I'll just live with the pad. I'll, yeah. I just won't go out. You know? right. But it doesn't have to be that way. You yeah. know, the, we yeah. can, like Aurelia mentioned, the, I think the end point here is a good quality of life. Yeah. 100 percent, I agree with that. Yeah. How we get there is determined by the diagnosis we make, yeah. how we investigate this patient, and how we manage the patient. That's mm -hmm. as simple as that. You yeah. know, we get yeah. that, if we get that that uh, line right, yeah. you like to have a satisfied patient at the end of the story. Yeah. You know, Kim Tanzan, I'm sure you you know in the patients that you interact with, yeah. the impact that this problem has on them. 
Look, uh, from a pregnancy perspective, I think there's this assumption that when you are pregnant, when you laugh, cough or sneeze, that you're going to pass some urine and it's normal. Yeah. So we obviously try to educate our moms that it's not necessarily normal and we encourage them to go and have an examination done mm. to make sure that it's nothing severe. Yeah. But I think most of the time we find that the moms just think, oh, you know, it's normal, I'll... I'll deal with this for the next nine months after my baby comes, I'll be fine and everything will be okay, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily the case because it can continue after childbirth as well because those muscles, your pelvic floor muscles, are the muscles that are being weakened mm -hmm. and that is the reason why um, you are passing urine possibly when you laugh, when you cough or when you sneeze. Mm -hmm. So we try to educate them and encourage them um, mm -hmm. to have their examinations done yeah. uh, because it is important for them to know uh, the severity of uh, the incontinence that mm -hmm. they're experiencing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so time for another break. When we come back, we'll, we'll now find out how actually this problem can be managed. Please stay with us. Finance Minister speaking last year was quite clear that one, he doesn't want a constant bailout of yes. state owned enterprises, including SAA. And then he also said there's no reason for SAA and we can get rid of it. The one that uh, people are talking about is the issue of privatization, but I don't think that privatization is within the horizon at the moment. But what I can say is the liberalization of the aviation industry may be on the horizon. Talk to us about um, the share that the continent gets as compared to the rest of the world. $1.85 trillion globally, 2.5% of that went into Africa in 2018. For us, the number one most critical issue in the energy industry of Africa is investment. It's time for us to be real stewards of our resources. Right, thank you so much for staying with us. If you've just joined us, we're talking urinary incontinence with our expert guests here. And uh, before we went on a break, we were talking about, you know, all the different causes and risk factors and how this, con this condition is uh, diagnosed. Uh, now we're going to be talking about how we actually manage this. And I'm going to start with you, Doc. Let's just talk principles around how the problem of incontinence is managed. Oftentimes, we don't just look at the sufferer, but... Again, you know, it may be a couple coming to you. Absolutely. Please take us through the principle. Yeah. So, as we mentioned, uh, we were checking about it but in the break. I think when we're doing the history, it's very important to understand as an end point that you want to accomplish what is the impact on quality of life. Yeah. Uh, Kolya mentioned about, you know, socially getting off a bus, going to the toilet, messing yourself, not going out. But the other aspect which is important to bring out in the discussion is intimacy. Yeah. How it's affecting their relations with their partner, etc. So, that one needs to obviously expand into that. And to understand that, a woman doesn't have to suffer through that. There are ways and ma ways we can treat the situation yeah. to improve that aspect of their life as well. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, uh, management, uh, clearly, you know, we often follow a principle where we don't always be too aggressive from the word go. Right. So we start to being conservative. Yeah. From conservative, we go on to medical therapy. And then if that fails, then we go on to more interventional, uh, less invasive, to the more invasive type of procedures to manage incontinence. As right. as perhaps, perhaps a good point to start talking about conservative treatment. Yes. And I think this is where you, you come in, uh, yes. Dr. Brandt. Yeah? Yeah, I think um, if I also just can refer back, it's very important to know what type of incontinence yeah. the patient has. So, yeah. um, because you are going to approach it a bit differently, mm. um, for example, urgency versus stress incontinence. Yeah. So, um, we would usually start with a, a good assessment of the patient where we physically assess the muscles, looking at what is the problem. You know, is it the strength of the muscle? Is the endurance, is it the timing? Mm. And based on that, we will then prescribe exercises. Mm. So unfortunately, many times um, patients read up on their own before, and, and I, mean, I think most of them have heard about Kegel exercises. But if you do it under the wrong circumstances, it can actually do a bit more damage than good sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we will assess them, and then we will start prescribing exercises based on what we found. 
We also use, for example, EMG, it's electromyography. It's a form of biofeedback. In other words, they can see on a little computer when they contract the muscle and when they relax because many times an important issue is to get the right contraction. Yeah. Um, it, you know, the pelvic, we also say the pelvic floor muscle is a bit difficult muscle because it's not like any other muscle that's on the outside, it's on the inside. So the patient itself can't always see, can't see the muscle and they can't also really feel the muscle. Like for example, if I contract my arm, I can see it and I can feel it. So that is what is a challenge with um, training pelvic floor muscles. So yeah. we would definitely start on just first getting the right contraction before we go anywhere from there. Yeah. Because if they use the wrong muscles, yeah. Again, that can actually increase the intra-abdominal pressure yeah. and, uh, you know, actually yeah. worsen the incontinence but, but, again. But that, the question is, how do you get them to identify the correct type of muscle? But be before that, okay. let's take a call. Uh, we have Mjoli uh, from the Eastern Cape. Mjoli, welcome. Morning, 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 sir. Morning, morning, Mjoli. Yes, morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. I, I was saying, on the 18th of December, 2018, Yeah. Uh, I had a surgery, a testosterone surgery. The what surgery, sorry? Surgery, I had a testosterone surgery, the operation. Yeah, we, we didn't quite get that, that type of surgery, but carry on, yeah? I was saying last year, December, the 18th of December, 2018. Right. Yes. I, I, I got an operation, testosterone operation. Oh, t t okay. Prostate, I think it is, the yeah? Reason the reason of the operation was that after I've been engaged in sexual activity, yeah. in the morning I was urinating blood or cloth. Yeah. Then I went to the urinary, especially urinary surgeon, I mean, neural, neural on, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Then they did that operation. Yes. But after the operation, I felt better. But now what I've noticed in the morning when I'm peeing, in the morning, yeah, I, I noticed that there are some. I feel that there's still urine in my in my in my bladder that is still there. Okay. Even after I, as urinated. All right. Then it, it will it, it comes out in form of some few drops after that. Okay. Then during the day I'm fine. Okay. So what could be the cause of that? All right. Thank you. That that's a very good question. So so so. So urethral surgery? Urethral? Yeah, it, it sounds it like, like, it sounds like had, urethral to me. Yeah, he had, yeah. Uh, you know, some sort of surgery. Yeah. And, and he's for, struggling to empty his bladder. So from, from, what, from what I understood, um, is that he initially had difficulty urinating and he did some surgery, I presume it was probably a urethral stricture. Yeah. And he also mentioned about that following intercourse, he had blood in the urine. Yeah. Uh, so what we call hematospermia. Yeah. You know? Well, especially if it's in the ejaculate. Yeah. Now, one is to differentiate whether that urine, that blood was in the ejaculate yeah. or whether it was just after intercourse that he yeah. went to urine and he saw blood. Yeah. They could differ. Yeah. But from what I understood, and a urethral stricture would kind of make sense what he's saying. Yeah. Because of a stricture very much will behave like a large prostate. Mm. It's, it's, it's occluding the outflow. Mm. So as a result of that, when you urinate, you don't urinate with ease. And so a, a lot of urine will stay behind in the bladder. Yeah. So it's, a, it's just a kind of a bladder, a kind of outlet obstruction. Yeah. Not at the level of the prostate, but now at the level of the urethra, right. which is the, the tube we spoke about early on. It's in the penile, yeah. penis itself. Yeah. That may have a stricture or a narrowing, from what I understood you said. Yeah. Uh, perhaps the latter end of what, what you were saying was that he's struggling now to empty his bladder. Yes. He goes to the toilet to empty the bladder, and uh, a few minutes later, he still feels that the bladder, you know, there's yes. still urine in the bladder. Yeah. He would, I would suggest that uh, he, he go, because he said that 2018 was the surgery. It's now been a year from then. Yeah. So most likely, if it was a urethral stricture, if I, if I understood him correctly, yeah. he's probably got a recurrence of the stricture. Yeah. For, the, for a stricture, it's a more mechanical type of thing. You know, the yeah. tube is like this, and now suddenly it's like, it's narrower. Correct. For that, he's probably going to require either some sort of a dilatation or an, uh, you know, a, a cystoscopy again to yeah. put a camera inside there and yeah. open up their space. So, so the idea that he needs to go work. back to... to I, I, I think yeah. it'll probably be better, especially All if he's right. having the situation a year, a year later now again. All right. Let's come back to you, Kim Thompson. Um, I, I'm going to come back to you about, you know, how people, you know, how you differentiate between the different muscles. But let's learn about what exercises then you give to the mummies. Okay, so a lot of the exercises that we do, um, obviously we're wanting to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles, which right. is obviously spoken a lot about. Um, and then we're also wanting to strengthen the perineal floor. 
Uh, so the reason why we do this is obviously to allow those muscles in that area to be strengthened um, because they weaken during pregnancy and childbirth. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the exercises that we uh, that we do do is one of them will be the pelvic floor exercises that Dr. Brandt mentioned. Um, we also do a lot of squatting exercises with, with the moms because while, while squatting, uh, you are strengthening the gluteus muscles, but also stealth, uh, strengthening your pelvic floor at the same time. Um, we also then go into uh, things like your pelvic tilts, which uh, tighten those pelvic floor muscles. And yeah. then we also do uh, squeeze and release exercises. And that uh, basically we do that to build the, the pelvic floor muscles and the reaction time. So how quickly does your pelvic muscles respond yeah. um, in time? And then we, we do a lot of bridge exercises. So we strengthen a lot of the times. We strengthen the legs, uh, the glutes, and then also the, the pelvic region. All right. Okay. So a lot of people, perhaps watching this program, might say, but, well, you know, we can't have access to these fancy clinics and, you know, where we get these uh, exercises and that sort of thing. Are there simple things that people can do at home? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think the important thing is is how you explain to do someone to do the exercise. Um, right. I personally never tell someone to to squeeze because what happens is they squeeze their buttocks and they squeeze their thighs, and then all the wrong muscles are contracting. Mm. So basically, if the pelvic floor muscle contracts, it moves upwards. It's not a closing and a squeezing like this. So they must literally think of it's as if they want to pull something into the bladder. So the muscle must actually lift up. And in that process, it closes the openings and it exercises the muscle specifically. Mm. Like she also said, you know, um, we sometimes we just start with a normal pelvic tilt. We just, they just roll the pelvis forwards and backwards. Just give to them that perception of where is the area, where is the muscle located. Mm. And so, how do they do this? Do they do this lying down? Yes, uh, they can do it lying down. Usually we start lying down, just do a tilt. They can do it in sitting, they can do it in standing. The more you go against gravity, the more difficult it becomes to do. Hmm. So mostly we start when we first see a patient in lying because that's the easiest um, position to do it in. Hmm. Um, and then as we progress, they can do it while they're sitting, while they're standing, while they're walking even, even while they're climbing stairs. Hmm. Um, you know, patients that can't come for frequent sessions, you know, you give them e these exercises to do basically um, just with their normal daily activities. Yeah. While they are sitting waiting for the children in the car, for example. Yeah. Just pull up, you know, the pelvic floor muscles, hold it for 10 seconds and relax. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's okay. the most important part. All right, okay. Be before you go on a break, I, I believe we have another caller, Anonymous, from Port Elizabeth. Uh, Anonymous, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Right. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so my problem is that I was sexually assaulted at a very young age. That would be around the age of four. Right. And um, I started noticing that I had urinary incontinence uh, post the incident as well, because I remember it was around the age of five whereby I would wake up and the bed was wet every night, and I've endured this. I'm now in my 40s. And it happened like maybe three times in a month. What I notice is that during the middle, it only happens at night. I don't have stress incontinence or the situation whereby you can't control your bladder whilst you're awake. It happens while I'm asleep. Right. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank We're you. very sorry for what happened to you. Uh, let's see if we Thank can get you. any help. Any, anybody yeah. can, yeah? Sure. Uh, so I thought you hear about your ordeal. Yeah. Um, for one, we need to also think about the trauma to the, uh, the, the, the the whole urethra, the sphincter mechanism. We need to consider that. From what I gather from what the, the lady is saying is that it's only it's not every day. It's three times a month yeah. that she's asleep and she doesn't wake up until she wakes up and the, the bed is wet. Right. Doesn't have stress and doesn't have any degree of urgency as she understood it as we explained it. Yeah. So, look, you know, often we'll be dealing with uh, what we call, let's say, uh, bed wetting or... In, in, involuntary encounter, which is not a way, you're just in your sleep. Uh, it can be related to uh, sort of discoordinated contractions of the bladder. You're not yeah. planning to want to urinate, and then the muscle just contract. Yeah. If you're in a very, very deep sleep, you don't even have that arousal mechanism to wake you up. Yeah. Uh, but what, I, what I'm going to suggest to, to this lady is that I think she needs to see a urologist yeah. for a pelvic examination and also to measure the volume of her bladder. Yeah. 
And she may also require what we call a urodynamic study. Yeah. Where we look at to see is there, are there any sort of involuntary contractions of the bladder which can be managed with medication. Right. Okay. I'm also going to suggest, uh, and this is how we manage our kids as well, from the psychological component yeah. of uh, uh, bed wet in, in, and uresis in that group. But in her group, I think we can apply a similar type of idea where I think she needs to, I don't know if she's been through, I mean, for consider her ordeal, I'm sure she's, it's a massive psychological impact it has on you. Yeah. I don't know if she's been through a psychological uh, sort of therapy or, or yeah. treatment, you know, but I certainly would adv advocate those two areas. All right. Uh, so to, so to look at that. Okay. All right. Time for another break. When we come back, we'll wrap up our discussion on urinary incontinence. Please stay with us. Police in Mahikeng have their hands full, stopping residents from looting shops in the Mahikeng Central Business District. As you can see behind me, it's pandemonium here in Mahikeng. The masses are trying to break the hold of the police to go into these shops and possibly loot them. And there we have it, the separation. Whoa, whoa. Look, 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 look. The police are trying their very best to control the crowd here. <laughs> He's saying that it's better for them to go in there and take the stock before it is uh, wasted in the fire. The exact cause of the fire is still unknown, but electrical fault is suspected. This must be a major knock for the economy of this area because this is an economic hub of Matigay. Our town is very small. When the shops are burned down, our people are really going to suffer economically and employment is also going to suffer because most of the people are working in these shops. This team doesn't know color. It's not a black or a white game. Um, this is what we achieve when we unite as a nation. That is it, South Africa! It's not about uh, rugby fans. It's, it's literally being a South African. I've got the fans. They're excited. Getting everybody into the mood. All right, excitement all the way. Let me move along the line. What is history making on, on another level? See, I'm Tanda Kuni's being the first black captain to lift this trophy. Springboks, champions of the world. Everybody, congratulations. Um, that was outstanding. The boys have uh, outshone everyone in the world. They are the best. Here's the cup. Welcome back. We're talking urinary incontinence. And uh, before we carry on with our guests, we have a caller on the line, Caroline from Rustenburg. Caroline, welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I've got a problem with my urine. When I, I cough, my urine just came out. And when I sneeze, my urine just came out. Even if I uh, try to run, maybe to exercise. Right. So I must put the pet so that uh, I cannot be embarrassed. Even yesterday, I went to the doctor. Uh, they they scanned me. They said they don't see anything. So they just they give me the med the med uh, tablet called L Larnel. It's L Y R I N E L, so that I can bring before they can send me to some specialist. All right. Okay. All right. Th th thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Chinara would like to take so that. So she's just described what we mentioned earlier on about stress, urinary incontinence. Right. Like coughing, sneezing, laughing, walking, etc. Yeah. Um, two things about what she just said now. She said she went to the doctor and the doctor did an ultrasound and said everything is okay. Just take some tablets. Again, you know, relying a lot more on investigation. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe she can't reveal to us all what was found in the examination. But yeah. again, this kind of individual, you need to know, first of all, uh, their body habitus, their, yeah. their body mass index, very important. And also, what her, is... Her age, perhaps, yeah. uh, which is what we forgot to ask. Yeah. Age, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. But she also did say that she was given tablets whilst waiting to see a specialist. Yeah, I agree with that. So, so, so with perhaps that. that, that's I'm going to make a point about it as well. So I think yeah. the pelvic examination is important. Perhaps she may saw a GP who yeah. feel good, okay, you know what, uh, maybe just done a basic urine test, making sure there's no infection, which is the right thing to do. Mm. Some GPs do have ultrasound in their room, so they probably just check the volume in the bladder pre- and post-voiding, yeah. and then a referral to a specialist. 
We do something at GPs that start the patient on in some medication, like an anticholinergic to relax the bladder, which is what she described. Yeah. Now, again, you see that tablet is really used more for urgency, urgent continence. Yeah. If a patient doesn't have that, it's probably not going to make much of a difference. If it's purely because there's a weakness of the pelvic floor and the bladder is collapsing or the urethra is just uh, you know, coming down with, with, with straining, the medica- medication is going to do nothing for their patient. Right. Just give them a dry mouth and some side effects. Yeah. You know? But look, another lady is going to be going to see a special. But I, I sometimes discourage the GPs from just prescribing any tablet yeah. just because they think it's going to help incontinence. Right. That's more for urgency and not for stress. This was the point we made early on. You yeah. know, it's counterproductive for the patient in any right. case. Right. But I think uh, she's right. She needs to see a specialist, yeah. full pelvic examination. Yeah. And if it's, she's describing it as pure stress, yeah. she's probably going to require some sort of a procedure to deal with that situation. All right. We have another caller on the line, Titi Malo from uh, Zirast, I think it is. Titi Malo, welcome. Uh, how are you, sir? We're good. How are you, Titi Malo? I'm all right. Uh, I have a problem with my nine year old boy. Yes. Yeah, every time when he plays, this thing started last year. Every time when he plays, you'll find that he has wet his pants. Right. Then I, t- I, I did took him to the pediatrician. Then the pediatrician uh, uh, referred me to the urologist. Then they said he has to be circumcised. But I don't think that, that's the solution because uh, the urine doesn't start on the, on the, on the foreskin. Right. It's something which, which is happening every time when he plays. And when he's at school, then I need help on that issue because it's starting to embarrass him now. Mm. That's an interesting one. Yeah, that is, that is definitely. I mean, nine year old and was told the solution is circumcision. Yeah, she and she made a good point about it that the urine doesn't start at the foreskin, so Absolutely. she's passed the anatomy lesson already. Yes, she's done well yeah. in that. Uh, agreed. Uh, what I would have liked to have known is whether he's got any nighttime symptoms. Uh, specifically bedwetting and she mentioned about the daytime the school where she he doesn't he messes himself because he can't get to the toilet I presume and while he's playing sometimes it can be a simple thing like the child just doesn't want to go to the toilet mm-hmm. he's busy playing with the games or the, and just, just just holding 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 until eventually can't hold anymore and he messes himself maybe mm-hmm. as simple as that yeah uh, if there's absence of nighttime symptoms and there was no bedwetting and it's just daytime symptoms yeah then it needs evaluation yeah uh, we need to assess the child yeah. Uh, check for any neurological aspects that may be related to that. Yeah. Paresthesia, numbness in the feet, uh, issues around bowel function, constipation, uh, etc. Yeah. And then also to assess the volume of the bladder as well. Yeah. In some cases, we do also do a u- use a urodynamic study to decide what, yeah. what, what we need to do for these individuals. Right. But I think so this so, so basically, perhaps she must get a second opinion? I, I think she else? definitely needs to see a urologist, and yeah. I totally agree with her. It doesn't have much to do with the foreskin, yeah. the, what she's describing. Yeah. You know, certainly, not, I agree with that. Right. Let's come back to you, Kim Tamton. And, um, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, obviously the exercises that you, um, you give. Perhaps let's come back to your personal story. Um, you got involved with Yummy Mummies because you went through pregnancy yourself. Yes, so and, yeah, tell us about it. Yeah, so with my first pregnancy, um, I didn't come from a very active background. Uh, so I decided to start exercising during my pregnancy, um, but I obviously experienced a lot of unwanted pregnancy symptoms. Um, I didn't suffer that much from incontinence, but I always obviously felt the urge that I needed to be in the bathroom continuously. Um, I then, I spoke to my midwife about it and she suggested that I start the pelvic floor exercises um, and the Kegel exercises and so forth. So what I then did was it actually sparked my interest in knowing, okay, why do I need to do this, you know? Uh, what benefit is it going to have for me and so forth? Uh, so I decided to then specialize in pre and postnatal. Okay. Um, so, because I didn't just want to do exercises, read on the internet and so forth. I wanted to know why I'm doing what I'm doing and what benefit is it going to have to me. Right. Um, it then obviously, tremendous benefits uh, my pelvic floor strengthened it not only helped with my urge to go to the bathroom continuously it also then helped um, in my labor process giving birth was a lot easier mm. um, than anticipated or from the experiences that i've heard from other moms uh, so that really sparked my interest in wanting to help other moms okay. that struggle and, and, and how that. long is the training i mean how, how long does it take after birth you know, the training that you give to them. Look, so it, it basically depends also on the individual person. Right. So if you're only going to come to Yami Mommies twice a week, 
it can take you anywhere between three to six months yeah. for you to strengthen those muscles. But if you're going to be urgent about your progress and how, yeah. you, how well you want to advance in strengthening your muscles and so forth, and you do your exercises every day, right. um, we say anything between uh, one to three months, and then um, you just continue. It's a, it's a daily thing. So we're not only saying, come and do our exercises, yeah. we'll help you, but we encourage you to do exercises every day. Right. Things simple like walking and so forth can also help with all of that. Great stuff. Dr. Chinarabi, before we run out of time, the, the, we've spoken quite a lot about conservative management, okay. but there are other forms of treatment. Yes. Uh, medical, surgical, please take us yeah. through. So medical therapy, very quickly, it would be specific tablets to relax the bladder, yeah. especially for the urge patient, the urge incontinence, because the bladder is irritable, you can't hold on for too long periods of time. So we give you some medication to relax the bladder, it can fill up a little more, it can hold a more volume before you have the need to go to the toilet. Right. That's a broad area, right? And there's different ones that one can go through, uh, which is beyond the scope of the discussion. Right. The next thing we, do, we, we use, especially in urgency patients, in other words, those that we've tried medication, haven't had much great response or refractory to treatment. Mm. We can use something called Botox. It's so very much the same Botox that one uses, that women use on their faces, etc. Right. Uh, similar type of preparation, we just mix it a little bit differently. We take the patient to theory, we're going to put a camera into the bladder, a cystoscopy, and with a special needle, we inject this Botox fluid into or under, under the lining of the bladder. Mm. So it's working right the way it has to work. Mm. And often we find that those patients don't need to be on tablets, then they can actually deal they can handle their symptoms quite well. Yeah. The, the one downside of the Botox is that it wears out of your system after about nine months, okay. maybe maximum to a year. But six to nine months, you probably will require the procedure to be repeated again. Very straightforward, very minor procedure, day procedure, come in the morning, go home in the afternoon, probably that kind of thing. Okay. The other big areas are where there's prolapse or where there's significant uh, urethral uh, mobility, hypermobility, in which case you now need to use something to keep the structures there because mm. the pelvic muscles haven't helped or the medication hasn't helped. Now you need to sort of support this pelvic floor. And you can either do that by using some sort of a, uh, a, 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 sort of a sling or a, a device that we use yeah. to support the urethra. Mm. Or we also do a laparoscopic type of procedure mm. where we almost hitch the vaginal vault or the vagina itself to the, the sacrum, which is the bone sort of in the lower end of your back. Mm. So we, we sort of pull it tight so yeah. that it doesn't have that laxity yeah. to allow things to sort of pop through the, pop through the vaginal wall. You know, it just right. sort of strengthens the, the muscle, okay. uh, you know. What about Infinity. artificial sphincters? Yeah, so we do use that. That's in more in the male patient. Yeah. Uh, specifically in the cases where they've had prostate cancer, they had surgery, they're suffering with total urinary incontinence. We can put an artificial urinary sphincter in which they have control of. Yeah. Sort of like a little device in the scrotum which they can activate and deactivate either to sort of constrict the sphincter or relax it to allow them to urinate. After they've urinated, they've got to activate the sphincter again to close off that urethra. Okay. In the male patient, we also have something called the male sling as well. Yeah. Where, for a very similar type of patient, yeah. where you can use it again to support the urethra yeah. uh, to allow them to be continent or reasonably continent. Okay. Dr. Brian, just in the last few seconds, I mean, obviously, you get involved after surgery with most yeah. of these. Just yeah. quickly take us through that. Um, well, ideally, we would like to, or we prefer to be involved uh, even preoperatively mm, right. because... As soon as the patient gets surgery, unfortunately, they have a lot of pain and, you know, due to the procedures, they have to go through certain muscles and fascia that inhibits muscle contraction and, yeah. in, in other words, makes it difficult for the patient to do it correctly. So if we see them before the time and can teach them the right contraction, it's much easier after the operation to help them again to get the right contraction. Mm. And then post-surgical, um, it depends on the procedure that they receive, that yeah. on what we are going to do. Yeah. Um, but we will just gradually increase the exercise, not in the first couple of weeks, you know, to damage the normal healing process that right. has to take place. Yeah. Um, and then usually after about six weeks to eight, to eight weeks, mm. we can start with a, a more progressive treatment for them to help strengthen right. the muscles again. Right. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this program. I want to thank you so, so much for your contribution and your time. Thank and you. then wish that, you know, we do it again sometime soon. Thank and you to you guys at home, thank you so much for watching. We're back with you again in a week's time. And until then, please do take care. Thanks.
finance minister speaking last year was quite clear that one, he doesn't want a constant bailout of yes. state-owned enterprises, including SAA. And then he also said there's no reason for SAA and we can get rid of it. The one that uh, people are talking about is the issue of privatization, but I don't think that privatization is within the horizon at the moment. But what I can say is the liberalization of the aviation industry may be on the horizon. Talk to us about um, the share that the continent gets as compared to the rest of the world. $1.85 trillion globally, 2.5% of that went into Africa in 2018. For us, the number one most critical issue in the energy industry of Africa is investment. It's time for us to be real stewards of our resources. Ming Kwaneng is Moshweshwe's birthplace.